Hello, this is Gary Clifton. This is January 24th, uh, 2014. I'm going to be talking about the Ruby Mine today of uh, the property of North Bay Resources. This is a copy of a presentation that I gave on January 17th in Reno at the Geological Society of Nevada. Uh, before you is uh, yours truly with a couple of the nuggets from the Ruby Mine. These were mined between 1937 and 1942. Pictures taken in Downeyville, California at the courthouse. The Ruby Mine is world famous for the collection of nuggets that were saved during that period of mining. The uh, mine was financed by C.W. Best, a, uh, a co-owner of Caterpillar Mining Company, excuse me, Caterpillar uh, Equipment Company. They, uh, he had, he was quite wealthy, had oil wells, real estate, and opened this mine for the purpose of of exploring four large nuggets as you see here. Best collected or saved the uh, 109 or so largest nuggets, those that which were over a few ounces. These were kept uh, after his death in 1951. They were sold to Sierra County and uh, for $38,000 the value of the gold at that time. And for many years Sierra County showed these nuggets around the state at county fairs and things. Uh, the picture you're seeing, you see here, was from National Geographic in uh, 1973. This is in a bank vault. Uh, these are the large nuggets. And these are the real deal. Uh, I don't know how long ago, perhaps a decade ago, Sierra County realized that these nuggets had extraordinary value. They could not keep care of them. They didn't have a bank vault. They wanted people to see them. And so they gave them on permanent loan to the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. And the museum in turn uh, molded duplicates using latex uh, plastic and cast them in pewter, plated them in gold, and painted on a patina and return the duplicates to Sierra County, which are on display at the courthouse. And two of the duplicates are what I was holding in my hand. Uh, the lady you see before you is now 95 or 96 years old, still alive. The policeman behind her is the father of our uh, chief miner at the Ruby Mine, Charlie Johnson. This is a photo of the nugget collection in the Downeyville courthouse. Uh, the large nuggets on the top shelf there are the ones I was holding. This is a wonderful collection. There is nothing else like it in the world. People do collect nuggets. However, they could be from all over the world. The provenance is not known, but we know where, where these came from within close proximity of the mine, and we know when they were found. Okay, I'm going to be going through a series of title blocks here, and each one of them I'm going to show a beautiful young lady to keep the, to keep the old guys uh, paying attention. Uh, this is my wife, Anama, in Thailand. This picture was taken last July at a wedding, and my uh, and as I've told people, I admit to robbing the cradle. My wife is much younger than I. In this picture, she's 54 years old. So, location of the mine is at the arrow in the triangle that you see. At the lower left bottom of the map is Grass Valley, which is about 100 miles or so west of Reno and about 50 miles east of Sacramento. Uh, to get there, you go up Highway 49, which is through the center left of your screen, and then you cross over on, an, on, on a road that's very difficult to see there up toward Allegheny, which is just below the the uh, yellow uh, triangle, and then back through the woods to the mine. There is also a road from Downeyville just to the north there, just a few air miles away, uh, but it is uh, not accessible in winter. This is a view of the uh, surface of the Ruby Mine. It's uh, in the in the middle distance. You see the shop. Uh, to the left of the red pickup truck is our dry and our landing where we bring the rock out, drop it down to the mill. 
And to the right, we have various buildings. Uh, the immediate one in the front is our fuel storage area. And behind it is the attic to the, uh, is the Ruby attic. We're in beautiful country up here. We're about 5,000 feet. This has been a dry year. Normally at this time of year, we'd be looking at six or eight feet of snow and we'd be lucky to be in here, but we have been quite fortunate this year. This is in the, the loading area to the mill, which we call the landing. Uh, these cars have all been uh, repainted. They look much better now. Uh, but they come in on these rails, and the cars are tipped to the right down to a landing about uh, 15 feet below, which is the loading dock to the mill. This is the mill below. What you're looking at is a large trommel, which is rotates uh, on tires. It's all This is all large uh, electrical equipment that does this. The ore is fed into this, into this trommel from the left. Uh, slowly. The trommel turns slowly. There's water jets inside which washes the gravel as it turns around and it and under gravity it migrates downhill towards the other end. The gold and smaller particles come out through the ripples at the lower end of the trommel down into sluice boxes. A series of sluice boxes below and the oversized goes out over and it is dropped into uh, by a conveyor out into a waste pile. This is a picture of the Lowry shaft up at the upper part of the channel. Uh, 200 feet vertical down to the, the, to the workings. This is the Ruby Edit. This is the entrance at the, at the mill site. Uh, this is a, a horizontal tunnel or added. It is in the slates the entire way. The, the channel gravels are anywhere from 40 to 100 vertical feet above us. When we're in this tunnel, uh, this tunnel goes back almost a mile and a half. Dates from the 1800s. Uh, the first part of it uh, was extended out to its final length here in uh, uh, in the 1990s, and uh, and from there, about halfway in, we are in we're up on one of the old channels called the White Channel. Uh, all of the ore comes out of this tunnel uh, on our trams and our ore cars. Uh, going forward, okay, I'm going to talk about the the tertiary channels of the Sierra Nevada. This this picture here is in Kalamantan a couple of years ago. This young lady is from uh, a tribe that was only 100 years ago were headhunters, and she's showing me what she's going to do with her bush knife if I don't behave myself. Um, the tertiary channels are from 25 to 35 million years old. They are the so-called tertiary channels of Lindgren, uh, turn of the century. These are ancient rivers that crossed from western Nevada, which is on your right there, into present-day California and exited into the ocean, which at that time was in the Sacramento Basin. The Sierra Nevada did not exist at that time. Sierra Nevada is later. So there was a large expanse of flatlands uh, covering western Nevada and in the area of which is now the Sierra Nevada Mountains, uh, and of which these rivers crossed from wet, excuse me, from east to west. And these were enormous rivers. I mean, they some of them were many thousands of feet across, and there were lots of them. The picture that shows you here shows you a, a series of rivers coming in from east to west and then coalescing in the middle of the screen where these uh, various blocks are, uh, highlighted blocks, and then coming together to the left and then exiting into the ocean at that time. The What I'm attempting to show you here is how many of these rivers there was, and most of them are go do carry gold. And as we go in finer and finer, you so you'll see that there is more and more and more of them. The rivers in the area that we're studying, or that we're working on, uh, that previous picture crosses this geology map, which I won't discuss in detail. The block out area in the middle is where the ruby mine is, although the ruby mine is just a, a pinprick on that within that block. 
The area that you're looking at here is about 100 miles north to south and 50 east to west. But the yellow geology down the middle is called the Maloney's Fault Zone, which is a suture zone between subducted oceanic crust and the continent. And it is along that suture zone where, the plate, in plate tectonic terms, uh, one plate dived into the other is where you have mobilized quartz and gold, and they have come up. And the gold has been segregated in, in essentially vertical fault zones through that zone north to south, through that area where it is yellow uh, and uh, some other colors. And these quartz veins can be continuous for 10 to 15,000, maybe 20,000 vertical feet. So even though there's been a long history of erosion, these quartz veins are still there. Uh, the mother load country is replete with quartz veins. In the, in the geology vernacular, they're called mesothermal quartz veins, but they have been now recently, more recently, returned orogenic quartz veins. Uh, they are perhaps the most important source of gold in the world. Uh, the major gold provinces of the world are almost, uh, most of them are centered on orogenic quartz veins, which are completely similar to what we are looking here in the mother load. Here is a a uh, more detailed blow up of the ancient rivers that crossed. Uh, the arrow shows the small little area of the of the Ruby property, which you can see is on a just on one a tributary to a vast river system. This is about 40 miles north to south, 20 miles east to west. And it shows you where these ancient rivers were. Only fractions of them or portions of them remain many of them buried by volcanic flows, some of them been exposed. Uh, the, and, and as you go down even more detail, it becomes more and more complex. This was a long standing, very complex river system that, that was in place for 20 million years and survived various in, episodes of volcanic activity. Uh, the major workings on the surface, uh, the very famous huge hydraulic mines which uh, were which existed between the 1850s and 1880s are in the larger areas uh, the larger pink areas on the southern uh, on the south part of this diagram um, these are exposed on hillsides and mountainsides and these were hydraulic but gigantic nozzles and the gravel washed from these ancient rivers uh, the gravel going downstream eventually ending up in and uh, the Sacramento Valley, and in the 1880s, the courts blew the whistle on this because this, there was so much rock and sediment going into the river that the, Sierra, the Sacramento River became unnavigable, and, flood, and um, it was breaching its levees. And as well, uh, hundreds of thousands of acres of prime farmland were being flooded every year. So the hydraulic, the hydraulic mining on the surface was terminated in the 1880s, and at that point, more and more of the miners went underground on the buried river channels. This is an example of one of the areas where hydraulic mining took place. Uh, I'm, le I'm using a telephoto. We're probably 2,000 feet across from where I'm standing. And you're looking across what used to be a canyon full of river gravel uh, back in the 1850s. This this uh, where I'm standing was continuous to the upper surface of that that, that cliff over there, and under under this would have been hundreds and hundreds of feet of river gravel. It has all been washed out and has gone downstream, which is to your left. At the bottom of the of the bottom of that slope, you see white gravel, and that is primarily quartz gravel. And at the base of that, uh, underneath the very you know down at the very base of it was where the gold was, and so all of this overburden had to be washed away <clears throat> just to get down to the, the bottom 10 or 20 feet of where the gold was. This is what it looked like. This is what's called hydraulic mining. And you can see the remains of a river channel or the sides of a river channel where they're playing their water. And these are what are called hydraulic monitors, which are basically water cannons that water has been stored at some elevation, 100, 200 feet elevation back 
up slope somewhere. It might be many miles away, and it has been brought down by pipes and then forced out through a cannon. And this, these hydraulic cannons basically just tear away the cliffs, mobilize the rock and into sluice boxes, which you don't see here, but all of that rock is run through sluice boxes and the gold collected. And in this way, the previous picture, uh, uh, rivers of thousands of feet wide and hundreds of feet deep were completely excavated. If you go down to the area of the ruby mine, and you're looking at an area here about two and a half by two miles uh, with north up, this just shows you the complexity of the rivers and channels that exist. The, the, the old river channels are of two age, uh, and, and because there are geologists listening to me, the oldest, excuse me, the oldest ones are Eocene, which is about 30, 35 million years old, and those are in yellow. And the younger ones, which are Oligocene age, are about 25 million years old, and those are blue and green. And the Eocene age, the yellow channels, were laid down on the surface prior to any volcanic activity. After they were laid down, there was episodes of volcanic activity, thus that the the, the younger channels, the blue and the green here, were developed during volcanic times such that so that the gravel within them is primarily volcanic material rather than just pure quartz material which and some slate and volcanic and uh, metamorphic rocks which are characteristic of the older yellow channels. In the ruby area we have both ages. You can see that the younger channels are overprinting, going right over the top of the older yellow channels. The yellow channels were the ones that were discovered um, back in the 1850s and were mined for miles underneath the Ruby property and the adjacent properties. All of these are underground. Uh, they're buried from anywhere from 40 feet to six, 700 feet underground. Where, they, where the channels stop, and terminate at the top of the screen is where they exit out on the side of the hills. They're no longer buried. Uh, they have been eroded away, and so they basically disappear. There may have been remnants on them on hillsides and stuff, but they they were hydraulic away. But uh, the, the, the miners at that time were very astute. Uh, they knew what to look for when they're walking around the river cha the, the channels on the surface, the streams, in the rivers and the and just in the hillsides and they were looking for river gravels white big white quartz gravels rounded things like that which were indicative that there was a, <clears throat> that there was a buried river channel in there somewhere and say they were very good at this and it didn't take them long to find basically hundreds of these things all through the mother load area and you can see here if you look at the ends how many ends of these lines that we have, there's about a dozen of them. Uh, and all of these were found back in the 1800s. And this is thick forest with thick soil horizon on top. But these guys climbed every square inch of this and found the ends of these channels sticking out uh, underneath the volcanics uh, in the forest floor and then uh, started in on them and then excavated. Now, within this picture, only about a third of what you see here has been mined. Uh, a lot of this is inferred uh, uh, because we know where one end or the other of the tunnel was mined for a little ways, uh, and we know the direction, so we can infer the direction of them in, in which ones join the other ones like that. Uh, and so the value of the Ruby property is the fact that there's about four or five miles of these channels that you see here who have not been mined. The location of the Ruby Mine is right through, left to right through the middle in red. The portal is where it says Ruby Mine, that's the access tunnel which goes in at this, at this, uh, at this angular line going in, terminates in there about a mile and a half. And you can see at the end on the right, you can see a couple of what we term cross cuts red, in red that go up to the blue channel. The black squares are called raises. And so the blue channel, which is which at the property is termed the black, the black channel is where the work was done starting back in the 18, 1930s and where most of the gold came from. 
And where it did come from is where that those crosscuts at the end of that red line go over to that black square at the top of that. That is called the Big Bend. That is a bend in the river. You can see that very clear. That is where those nuggets, which I was showing you early, earlier in the courthouse, came from. And that is what our target is now. That and the green uh, channels that cross the red ruby at it, back towards about halfway up where that other black square is, we, we are mining in there as well. This is a graphic that kind of shows all the channels. Uh, it was done by a friend of mine, uh, Paul Hartley in Reno. And it basically shows that the channels are sitting on top of each other. You're looking from north at top, top, top left to, to, to the right, which is downstream. And you can see they sit right on top of each other. And this actually works in our favor because our, the ruby added goes right underneath it, right underneath it. And so we have access to three or four or five channels right over the top of the ruby at it. Okay, just to show you how complex things are, and I'm only going to show this for a minute, this is the mine map of the ruby of the ruby mine, and it's only to show that there is many tunnels, uh, what you're looking at is a collage of uh, many mine maps. This was put together by Randy Hinkle, who did the early work back in the 18 excuse me, 1980s on this property. We put all these old maps together. The Big Ben, which I just showed you, was dead center in the middle of the picture, coming from bottom to top. From the bottom, you can see that the ruby at it uh, comes up in straight line segments, terminates up there under the Big Ben. But coming in from your lower right, you can see this hatcher pattern. So those are other, that's the Bull Mountain channel, that, uh, one of the Eocene channels that was mined starting way back in mid-1800s and was mined right through the property. And uh, and so you can see there's, there's mine workings all over the place. Uh, and thankfully, we have most of these mine maps. Now, I'm going to talk about the mine geology. Um, this picture here was taken in Sulawesi about three years ago. I was in a village there and uh, was accosted by a group of... Uh, young high school girls and they all came up to me snapping my picture snapping my picture with their cell phones and they were all very shy very sweet but the only one of them was brave enough to stand next to me so this young, young uh, lovely young lady uh, uh, had her picture taken with me and uh, and I know they've seen westerners before but uh, it must have been a while because they were they were sure curious about me so now, in the mine, this is what it looks like. These are the old workings that date from the 1930s. Uh, it was unmechanized at that time except for a train. and uh, But most of the mining was done by hand. So a great deal of the old workings look like this, where you're looking at timbers holding up the back, the roof, what we call the roof. And it's a mess, and it's dangerous. Uh, and... Uh, Parts of this mine, oh, I've been all through it with the, uh, the chief miner, it was Charlie Johnson, uh, mapping, uh, sampling, and things like that. But there's parts of it like this uh, that uh, if you know what you're doing, they're safe. If you do not know what you're doing, it is very unsafe. Now, in, in the 1980s, the mine was reopened by Alhambra Mining. Uh, for whom Randy Hinkle worked for, and in the early 1990s, it was opened by Brush Creek. Chief geologist there was Tim Sandberg. And the mine was mechanized, and uh, not only a few hundred yards from where I just showed you, they brought up heavy equipment, and, and the old workings were all gutted out, and they brought in big rubber track vehicles, and they advanced the mining that way. So you will see it is much larger. You can even see uh, uh, the prints of the rubber tire still after 20, 20 years are still in, in the floor. The river, the gravels that we're after are visible at middle left in the screen under that tape hanging down. You will see a rounded boulder sticking out of the wall. The gravels in the mine that we're after, and we're going to look at those in great detail, 
are only from one to about three feet thick. Uh, when they mine, you mine into the basement rocks, which are slates, which I will show you. You mine down two or three feet into those and then through the gravels and two or three feet above. There's always a minimum mining height. You can't, you can't mine something two feet high because you can't get a man or a machine in there. So typically you mine six to eight feet in height. But it is important that you mine down in the basement because they're full of cracks and a lot of the gold will settle down into those cracks. Okay, this is what, uh, this is an example of where the gold comes from. The, the Mother Lode country is full of quartz veins that look like this. Uh, they're everywhere, and as I've said before, they are, they, they are sub-vertical and extend down, way down into the earth, thousands of feet, and way above us where it has been eroded. Within the mine workings, there are lots of veins like this, so there's no question of where the gold came from. The rivers, before they were buried, would look something like what you're looking at here, and they are constantly eroding these quartz veins, and the gold is liberated from them and concentrated in the river channels. When the channels were buried by volcanic, volcanic activity, uh, the gold was preserved in the gravels. So what we're doing now is we're basically coming into a channel that looked like this and mining right up through the middle of it. Uh, the, center, the center part of the channel is over to the right there. and going right up the middle of it and looking for the gold that was liberated from these quartz veins. Now in some of these mines, these quartz veins have been found to be extraordinarily rich and indeed uh, the mines like the Titaner and the 16 to 1 at Allegheny, which are world famous for being extremely rich gold mines, and they're over 100 years old, they originally started out as mines that were put in on underground buried river channels, such as the Ruby. And in the workings, uh, as they went along the buried river channel, mining the gold, they came across these quartz veins, and some of them turned out to be extraordinarily rich. And they forgot all about the gravels and then started mining downward on these. And, and uh, the 16 to 1, probably the most famous, is still being mined off and on. It has hundreds of miles of underground tunnels on it. It would not be uh, unlikely that we find something similar in the ruby mine because we're on the same geologic trend of the famous mines at Allegheny. Uh, we're only a few miles away. We're exactly right on the same trend. Uh, there has been a few small veins found in the ruby mine that contain gold. One is called the wolf vein, which uh, there was about 3,000 ounces uh, extracted from it and uh, went about a third of an ounce per ton. Only It was only mined down a few hundred feet. And uh, But there's other veins here, some of them quite large, uh, but we haven't found any that are really rich in gold, but then that's really a function of the fact that we haven't drilled any. Uh, there are dozens of drill, excuse me, there are dozens of swarms of veins throughout the ruby workings that warrant diamond drilling at depth. And if we can get moving on this and get a sufficient budget, we will do that. And it may be one day that the ruby mine becomes famous for having extraordinarily rich quartz veins, like the 16 to 1, as well as it's uh, the wonderful nuggets that uh, it has produced, and of course, will be producing when we get uh, when we get ahead. Now, this is a map of the Ruby Mine, north is to left, and I'm going to be coming back to this mine. Excuse me, to this map several times. At the top left, you see it says Lowry Upstream. That is the upper part of the channel, and it flows downstream to the bottom right. Of course, this it is all buried. The workings that you see here, which are about a mile and a half or so, were put in between 1937 and 1942 by uh, uh, C.W. Best and uh, Louis Hulstonk, who was his mine foreman. Uh, the Ruby, excuse me, the Lowry uh, shaft that I showed you in a picture is over there at the top left, where it says Lowry, pointing uh, pointing at it, Lowry upstream. Uh, the gravels were mined in the bottom of the channel throughout the length of this, and in the later years, you'll see at the center of this map, channel or cross cuts and tunnels that are starting to go off to the top of the map at various places. Well, these were going up the side of the river channel. 
you have to picture that the river channel was maybe 100 feet wide and it had rims on it, maybe 10 feet high. So in other words, the river might have been 10 feet deep, 15 feet deep, 100 to 150 feet wide. And there were tributaries, little streams and smaller rivers that came into it. And these had gold in them. Uh, and so the work, the workings, the tunnels that you see as center, at the center of the map going upwards are all chasing some of these tributaries that were contributing gold to the main channel. And when we look at this channel here, it is the black channel. Uh, I must uh, repeat that. We're looking at the black channel, which is a Oligocene age channel. It is primarily volcanic activity with not much quartz in it. Now, the areas that we're going to be talking about are on the right. One is the Big Bend, as labeled, and the other is, I have it labeled, a study area. Study area is the area that is accessible to me over the last few months and where this talk is based on. It is an 800-foot stretch from that crosscut that comes in from the lower left. That's called the 109 crosscut. And then up to the Big Bend, there's about an 800-foot stretch in there that I've spent my time on and been able to extract a lot of geology from, which we will discuss. And we will come back to that. The Big Bend is the area of where the large nuggets were found. And the Big Bend is simply a big bend on the river. If you visualize the river as coming from left to right, it went through, it swung around into a big bend, which was about 500 feet across, and then kept going down to the bottom of the screen. You see that you see that everywhere in nature today. There was nothing different about the rivers then. The only difference here it was buried, which makes it a little bit more difficult to kind of discern and visualize when you're underground, because underground you can see nothing except what is above and to the right and left of you. Uh, and if you're in a tunnel that is only 10 feet high and 10 feet to left to right, that's all you see. And you have to be very imaginative to figure out what's above you to the left and right, what's in front of you, what's in back of you. And of course, the miners uh, and some of the miners who are working at the Ruby now have been working in these mines their careers, further careers, off and on through the Mother Low Country, and they're very astute at this. I, I pay a lot of attention what the miners tell me, and I'm, I'm playing catch-up. Um, I'm learning very quickly about the Berry River channels. I hope to be expert in them soon, but a good deal of what I've learned is just listening to what the miners tell me and what they show me underground. Now, we're going to talk about the, the geology of the river channel. Uh, this is a picture taken three years ago. That's me, my wife, Anima, in the middle, and Perry Leopold, our benefactor of uh, North Bay Resources, who has doggedly kept this project moving despite many setbacks, many heartaches, and uh, but he has kept at it for over two years now, uh, has not said, has not accepted the word no on anything. And it seems now that after two years of hard work that we are on the verge of starting to produce some rock and get in there where the gold is. So I believe in this shot, this was the first time that uh, Perry and my wife had ever been underground. So they both have to look like this is one of their last days on Earth. And I'm quite sure that my wife, Anima, is the only woman in Thailand who has ever been in an underground mine. This was taken at the Lowry shaft. We're going vertically down here into the old workings, uh, about 200 vertical feet. Now, um, I'm going to talk about um, first the. Let me review what I'm doing here quickly, quickly, quickly. Uh, yes, I am going to talk first about the geology of the Lowry area, which is where we just. That picture was just taken. That's at our top left. The geology up there in the channel is quite different from what it is down to the bottom right. Um, quite different. It's the same channel, but the, the geology is more complex. Different types of rocks. There's evidence that there's at least two channels up there that have overlapped each other. And in between the two, between the Lowry and the study area down to the right, I have a mile of workings. 
of which I have not even seen yet, which we will be uh, getting into shortly because we're putting a new raise in there. And there is enormous amount of geology in that area. Uh, that's going to be a wonderful time for me as a, uh, as a geologist to get in there and to study that and try to untie what's been happening here, all for the purpose, of course, of directing exploration and mining. So we're going to start at the geology up at the upper left at the top of the channel in the Lowry area. Now, this is what's called the stratigraphic section. This is the geology of the river channel up at the Lowry area, at the top end. And the geologists will know what this means in a flash. And I don't expect the novices to understand this greatly. But basically what it means is you're looking from oldest on the bottom. Uh, this, is, this is a series of rock types. As you go anywhere on the mine, it looks a little bit different. But these are the, these are the main rock types in the Lowry area that you would see if you walked around there. And after you were a little bit clued in, you would be able to recognize them. But the rivers were laid down on what's called a Paleozoic basement. Paleozoic meaning rocks that are hundreds of millions of years old. And they're primarily slates and shales and things. Uh, they were ancient sea sediments. Now they've been cooked up and they look like slates. The rivers were carved into that, into those rocks. We call that the basement rocks. And upon that were laid a series of rocks in a river channel. And, and this whole series of river channel, a river gravels here, only is about 20 feet thick. But it starts out as there is a boulder layer, rocks up to a foot in diameter or more, on the very bottom. What you see there says boulder layer plus gold. Gold is AU. And that's where the gold is. The very bottom rocks laid in this river channel are on the bottom rocks. And this this layer there, which is, as you can see on the left column, is 0 to 4 feet in thickness, is where the gold is. The rocks above it are dead. They don't have anything, but you still have to mine them. The purpose of even studying these is the fact that the boulder layer comes and goes. Sometimes it's not there, sometimes it is. And... As a geologist, your task is to try to understand everything that happened where you were mining in, in excruciating detail because it is, it is our science that, that has demonstrated that the more you understand about it, the more you can predict where if, that, if your target is gold, that you will be able to predict where it's going to be or it's not going to be such that you don't have to mine it. Um, and so it is all a great uh, and sort of wonderful detective game of looking at these rocks. Each of them have their own history. They mean something to a geologist. And try to reconstruct the environment, which means if this, if, there, if this was a running river right now and we were looking at these rocks stacked up, where did these different rocks come from? Which way were they traveling? Uh, what was, were they, was it a fast running river, a slow running river? Was it, a, was the area flat? Was the area in a canyon like in a mountain? What was going on? And it is not an academic exercise. Uh, the, the, the role of the economic geologist at any mine is to, is to do it precisely this. And it is, all high science, it involves a lot of expertise by different people, uh, and but it has been shown to pay. You just cannot go into a mine of any type, doesn't matter if it's on the surface or underground, and just start digging. Gold, copper, molybdenum, lead, uranium, doesn't matter what it is, does not form to solid beds like a table. It's distributed unevenly in the rocks, thus you have to understand the rocks in great detail. I'm going to get a little bit comp I'm going to look I'm going to get a little bit technical here because I know there's geos listening to what I'm saying here. So from the bottom up you have your boulder layer with the gold in it and on top of that you have what's called a debris flow which consists of rhyolite schist and river gravels and the debris flow is basically like a landslide that has come down the channel of the river course down through the middle of the riverbed and torn it all up ripped up some of the bottom gravels and churned it all up into a big mess of mud and sand and then deposited and this layer is deposited. 
uh, that may or may not be where you're standing. So it, it shows you it's 0 to 20 feet thick on the left hand. Uh, primarily, the primary layer overlaying the, gra uh, the basal gravels, the gold-bearing gravels, is a well-sorted cobble gravel, which are rocks that are about four to six inches in diameter. They're all well-rounded, about the same shape, so we call it well-sorted. It's red, it's oxidized, the iron in it, and has been oxidized to red or limonite. Uh, and that will be a layer of, say, zero to five feet. Overlaying that, if it does exist, is a volcanic, is, is a what we call a carbon layer, which is the lower layer there, which is basically a sand layer that is, it is full of chunks of, of organic debris, such as limbs of trees and bark and leaves and twigs that have been cooked. Uh, they've basically been caught in a fire uh, and then died, of course, and then got caught up in in the river system and then redeposited along with sand and rock in the riverbed. Above that is a volcanic mud, which is uh, uh, just, a, just a black gray mud layer that has a lot of volcanic material in it. And above that, we have a coarse cross-bedded sand layer. And above that, we have what's called an andesite lahar, which is volcanic. Now, it's important to realize that everything above the boulder layer on the very bottom consists primarily of volcanic material. The rocks are volcanic. Uh, they're made out of andesite. The sands are full of volcanic material. Uh, the volcanic, excuse me, the volcanic mud layer and carbon layer or sand layers or mud layers are just full of volcanic minerals. Uh, don't need to go any more detail than that. The sequence, basically after deposition of the bottom boulder layer, was volcanic. And that is what basically buried, well, of course, that's what buried all of these channels, and, but also determined the faith of them even when they were running. And we will talk about more of that when we get down to the other part of the channel, because there's evidence that the volcanic activity just cut the channel off and it was rerouted. So what I'm going to do is to show a few pictures of what a debris flow looks like and the underground here at the Lowry to show you what the bottom gravels look like in this debris flow. The debris flow, which is not on the lower part of the channel, which we go to next, is very important. It has a great deal to do with interpreting what the gradient of the river was, that is, how steep it was, uh, the relief of the area, which means uh, if the river was running through an area that was flat or if it was a canyon in the mountain, uh, in, a, in a hillside or a mountainside. Okay, this is a picture of the debris flow. The debris flow basically is a fluidized bed. Uh, you might call it a landslide, but is usually created when you had too much water, such as rain, saturated the soil, and the whole thing lets go and comes down as basically as a landslide. It is fluidized in the sense that it is saturated with water and it's a mud. Uh, and it'll come down a hillside, and if it's in a river channel, it'll just come charging right down in the middle of the river channel. And what characterizes it is full of, it is completely unsorted. You will find pieces of everything. Big rocks, little rocks, sand, trees, uh, dinosaurs, uh, all kinds of things will be mixed up in this thing. Another shot. This is a picture of a debris flow. I think this is Venezuela on the side of a volcano. But this is an example of a chaotic mixture of just about everything. Big, big river boulders, trees uh, that have come washing down a river in a fluidized bed, basically as a landslide within a riverbed. Uh, you can see the scale of the man standing there at the left. This is what happened uh, at least at one of the layers up at the Lowry. I go to the next slide. This is a uh, from Google. I don't know where this is from, but this is a debris flow. And you can see here a mixture of rounded river gravels of different sizes and also angular boulders that clearly don't belong there. They have been mixed in. The matrix is a matrix of sand and mud. 
that is suspending all of these larger rocks. This is what's called a matrix supported uh, sedimentary layer. If the rocks were sitting on top of each other, holding each other up, it would be called class supported. This is very analogous to what we see in the ruby, is what I'll show you. This is another debris flow uh, behind the lady there. Big rocks mixed in with all kinds of things. It shows that the rocks are laying over from right to left. That's called imbrication. Indicates that the flow of this layer of rock and mud was from right to left. And it's sitting on a basement behind her of slates shot full of quartz veins. I don't know where this was taken, but this is very analogous to the rocks that you would see in the mother load and in the ruby mine. Now, this is a shot in the, in the route, uh, in down the Lowry shaft. What you see here, and this is the first shot of geology, so I have to explain it. You have the basal slates on the bottom there, which are these vertically foliated, striated, bluish rocks with quartz veins in them. And overlaying that on a very irregular surface is a stack of rocks. Uh, the upper part of this consists of very big, rounded river boulders and some quite sizable, highly angular rocks, mostly schist and rhyolite, all mixed together in a big, sandy, muddy matrix. You notice that they, the rocks are not sitting on top of each other. They're suspended in this muddy matrix. That is the debris flow. I'll show more examples of that in a few minutes. Underneath that, and laying right on top of the shales, uh, at center and over to the right is a layer of about a foot thick which is a little bit darker it's stained with manganese of some smaller rocks and that is the basal gravel that is the original basal gravel that is gold bearing and consists of generally not very big rocks uh, more smaller rocks uh, a little bit of angular material but what has happened here is that the debris flow has come right over the top of that and ripped that up. Uh, the bigger rounded boulders in the middle of the seam there were originally sitting on the basement as part of the basal gold bearing gravel layer that had been ripped up, rolled around, and caught up into this mass that has flowed down this river channel. Here's another scene from it. That's, that's my backside to the left there. To the right there, you see right at about my shoulder level going across, that's the basement rocks, that's the slates. And then on top of that, you have this stack of big boulders and a matrix of kind of reddish, dark reddish brown oxidized sand and mud. And again, to the right, top right there, you see enormous angular rock fragments, rhyolite and schist and things intermixed with big boulders one there has a drill hole in it on the right. And then in, in the matrix in between is a mixture of rounded, rounded rocks, mud, angular rocks. Uh, where my, in the middle, right in the middle of the scene where I put that vertical uh, spray mark there, that's a sample point, and that is right on top of the shale. That's where we're going to sample for gold. But you're looking at... Uh, uh, a thin layer which may or may not even be still there anymore. It's hard to tell if it hasn't been ripped up by this debris flow. But that scene is the debris flow. Now, here I am again, same spot, and I'm pointing the direction of flow. You can see that the rocks are laid over from on their right. They're kind of pointing to the right. That's the imbrication. It indicates that the water flowed, the mud flow or this debris flow flowed from right to left over the top of the shales, which you can see my mark again under my hand, the red mark, that's the top of the shales. And you can see the shales are all broken up. Uh, on the left there, you see these faults and cracks that are going down to the rock, and they, and they basically those fragments are being lifted right out of, the, out, of the, out of the basement. That's because of the pounding of these enormous boulders rolling over the top of it, just pounding the crap out of the basement. Um, next scene. This was taken, uh, uh, again, down the Lowry, not too far from where I was standing. 
This is my son on the right and Rick Frederking, the mine owner at the left. It's taken three years ago. And, and Rick and my son are sampling the bottom gravels, what is remaining of the base of gravels. The slate, or the shale, is to the left and right of both of them at shoulder level. You can see it. And then above it is this chaotic mess of enormous rock fragments, some of them as big as an automobile, mixed in with rounded river gravel, which has been plucked up off the bottom of the river channel and mixed up and this whole mess went flowing down the channel. So we are sampling right along the top of the shales where the gold normally would be uh, all through the mine there tried to get some idea of grade and uh, distribution of gold. Now this is in the Lowry and you can see the glove for scale scale this is where the debris flow does not exist. This is the intact river channel. The bottom two feet here or so, which are, has this kind of metallic sheen to it, which is manganese. This is the basal gravel, which contains the gold. On the bottom there, you can see the shales. And you can see that the foliation or the cracks in them is parallel to the view of the scene. In other words, we're not looking in the cracks. They are parallel to us left to right. And the river is flowing along the direction of the cracks in the shale. I'll come back to that in a minute. What you see in this scene here is a very tight, compact mixture of river gravels. You can see that they're laying from, they're laying over on their left hand side. They're laying from, uh, laying to the left. Next to my glove there, that big one, it indicates that the water flowed from right to left. The imbrication is from to the left. And if you go higher up in the scene, up behind the hoses there, you see some round gravels up there. That's an upper gravel layer that is not associated with this one. Uh, that's the upper gravels, uh, the other oxidized gravels above. But I will show more of that in the lower part of the mine next. Now, the, the what you're seeing here, this this lower gravels here are kind of compact. They're older than, obviously, older than the rocks above them, but quite older, quite a bit older. They are, what are the terms, semi-lithified. You do have to drill and blast them, although you can pick the rocks out with a, with a rock hammer if you have the time. But what you're looking there is rocks that have all come together in all a, a continuum of rock sizes that have filled every space from the size of sand grains up to pretty monolithic boulders there. That is what is termed composite fabric, uh, where you have a continuum of rocks and sand, etc., that fill up every space. And what's important about that is that any grain of gold or fragment of gold that gets caught down under that cannot get out. In rocks that are class supported, where you have a lot of you have a lot of rocks and then a lot of sand, but not much in between, the sand is always moving. Uh, it is fluidized, and as the river moves, that sand is always moving between the boulders. And if gold can gets in there, there's a chance it can get washed out. It's not such a problem for gold, but when you get into uh, diamond mining uh, in South Africa in these old channels, it is very important because diamonds don't weigh anything. And they have found that the only place that the diamonds will be caught in a placer is in an area where the rocks look like what we see here, which is termed composite fabric where all of the interstices and all the, all the holes in the rocks, the gaps in the, in the voids, have been filled up with other rocks of continuous distribution of sizes. And so once trapped in there, a diamond cannot be washed out. So, and the other important thing about here is the orientation of the shales at the bottom of the picture. Contrary to what I knew when I came here, I always thought that the best place to find gold, and be it on the surface or underground, as if you're in a river, is where you have the rocks which have a foliation to them, which means basically furrows in them, a striation to them, would be normal to the water, to the direction of water flow, which means the water is flowing at 90 degrees to those uh, furrows in the rock. Well, that's not, the miners tell me no. They like it to go parallel. In parallel is what you're seeing here. The water is running from right to left, and the foliations in the shale are parallel to the screen, to review the screen. And that, that surprised me, but they say what happens is that the water will dig out 
the cracks in in the fully in the cracks in the rock, dig down deep, and the rocks will you know, because the water is going parallel to them. Dig them out. The gold will get down to the bottom of theirs and get get packed in them, packed into them, and it can't get out. So the miners, when either when they're hydraulicing, you know, I mean, they've got a little suction dredge up on a river, or if they're underground like this, they'll get in what's termed a seam, which will be a crack in the rocks, in the basement rocks, and it'll find it'll be packed with gold, and they'll follow it, and it'll be parallel to the foliation in the rocks, not normal to it. So it is because the stream, the river passed parallel to it, excavated a little channel right out of it, and the gold got in there and got caught and packed in there. Um, okay, we're going to go now downstream to the right to the area of the Big Bend and what I call the study area, which is where I've spent my time doing uh, more detailed geology. So to the bottom right we go. And a blow up of that area, uh, left is, excuse me, north is to the left. But there's two main areas that we want to talk about. The top there is the Big Bend, which is this ancient bend in the river, now buried, and what I call the study area, for lack of a better word, which is about 800 feet between where you see that cross cut coming in from the bottom, bottom middle of it, on the bottom of the scene, uh, coming in. And then going up to the top right, that's cross cut in the basement rocks. And then there's a raise, which is that uh, thing that looks like with little arrows on it, about 100 vertical feet, comes up into the old workings. And I work from there up to up to the Big Bend, basically where that upper arrow points to. Um, it's not much area, but the secrets of the entire channel are revealed there. And uh, typical of geology, you don't have to study the whole thing. Uh, Basically, if you can find two or three square feet of an entire ore deposit and understand that, <laughs> being a bit facetious, but often that will give you uh, a great deal of uh, a great deal of knowledge about what's going on. So we go now and explain what I did to begin with. In these workings, when I when I first got when I first visited the mine three years ago in the Lowry. I was looking at that, and intuitively I knew that the control, the, uh, the geology I wanted to do, the simple thing I wanted to do first was to make a very high resolution elevation map of the bottom of the channel, which means I wanted to go through the mine workings in every place that I could measure the top of the shale, which is what the gravel was laid down on, on the bottom of the channel. I wanted to make, I wanted to measure the elevation of that exactly all through the mine and then i want to create a three-dimensional contour map of it to see what the shape of the bottom of the channel is now anybody who's ever been panning gold or anybody's ever suction gold up bottom of a river they look for the low spots obviously they look for the bends and things and i thought okay since we're underground we don't have a, we don't have visual access to much if i had a very high resolution elevation map basically a three-dimensional topographic map at the bottom of the channel. That should tell us, give us some idea of where the pools were, where the ripples were, and I'll come back and explain these things, and and tell us which way the channel was going. I just knew that was cheap information to obtain, didn't have to send it to a laboratory, it could be done with a surveying instrument. And so that was the first thing I wanted to do. And so what I did is that I went up into this channel and there was a few established survey points in the back, which is the roof, from uh, from Brush Creek days back in the 90s. And I took I took those elevation points and I took off from them. And using a simple carpenter's laser, which is a tripod and a laser with a horizontal vertical on it, uh, got it at Home Depot for $69. I would take off from those points and I would shoot level lines all through the workings, marking the points on the walls with flagging, writing down the exact elevation of that point, and then shooting back to those. And, and I would shoot back to a laser, and I'd be above or below that point, and that would give me the elevation of where my laser was, and I could then take off from there and shoot around and put some more tags on the walls. And eventually, I had 
uh, basically I started one end of the mine and I worked clear up to the other and I record and then of course when I had where, wherever I was I would shoot my laser against the walls and I would measure the elevation of the top of the shale above or below my laser point it's all tied in very nicely it was all simple and I went through that I went through the workings that you see here and probably a matter of about four man days and recorded about 250 elevation points on the top of the shale I then put those into a three-dimensional uh, computer mapping program called LeapFrog, which is used for mine modeling or ore deposit modeling, which has wonderful graphics. I put it in there, and LeapFrog generated a continuous three-dimensional surface that honored all points exactly. Uh, and so basically modeled the bottom of the channel. That was step number one. I'll come back to step number two in a minute. Uh, but the, what this what LeapFrog does is produce a mathematical surface that honors every one of those points, and thusly every where the, the areas between the points are modeled continuously. So, and they're highly accurate. So the interpolation between point A and point B, which might be a foot difference in elevation, is going to be a smooth surface that runs through them and... Um, and from which I can extract the elevations later at any point in the mine. So that was the first point, and I will show you what that looks like. What I'm looking at here is the three-dimensional view of the bottom of the channel. I'm looking from the bottom of the channel, looking upstream. Forget about that blue pointer in the middle. But the green dots are all of my elevation points, and I have... I have 2x times elevation accentuation on the 2x vertical accentuation on this image where you can see the relief. Now, I'll be coming back to this over and over again, but basically what it shows is that we have a river channel. That, if, and from your front view here, it goes around, goes around that blue thing, <clears throat> and then it starts curving up to the upper left, which is basically going up to the northwest, northeast. Um, off to the right, the top right there, you see elevation points up on what appears to be a bench above the river. This, these are in mine workings, so there was gold up there. So you have to say, okay, uh, what was the gold doing up there? You can see on the center right that looks like a bunch of little streams coming down, cutting into the side of the river. you got to remember, though, that the, ele the absolute elevation difference here most of it is only about 10 or 15 feet. This, this isn't the Grand Canyon. This is just a shallow little river going across the flatlands. Uh, you, you know, there's a thousand of them around. It was probably vegetated. You probably wouldn't pay any attention to it. But it had an extraordinary amount of gold in it. But there was nothing. It, this river was just a little stream, frankly. It was, it was only 100 feet wide, 10 feet deep. That's about it. Uh, at the bottom right, you see that the, that the side of the river is quite steep. You've got some vertical cliffs in there. Um, and over on the left, uh, it seems to, the slope seems to be shallower and kind of, uh, uh, kind of slopes in uh, more shallowly. It doesn't seem to be vertical. Now, everything outside these points is guesswork. It's just the mathematical model is attempting to connect them all on a continuous surface. Well, we don't know what is on the left center of this screen, if that's a big, if that's a gently sloping area, or if it's vertical, or what the heck's going on there. But this was the starting point. So from there, I can, I can do all kinds of magical things in the program. Here I'm looking down on the bottom of it, straight down, what's called plan view. It's the same thing I showed you two screens back where I showed you the mine workings. And what I've done here is that you can see there's some shaded relief in that image. And I'm taking what's called a level slice, and it's a horizontal plane, and I've cut the bottom off of the river. Remember, this is a river channel with relief in it. It's got some high and low spots in the bottom. And I basically cut the bottom off, so you can look through the bottom. And these, those areas in black, those holes, are the low spots in the channel. What those are, in the vernacular, are pools. 
these are the low spots in the bottom of the river. The areas between are higher. Those are called the ripples. And everybody who's done anything in hydrology, anybody who's done anything in uh, um, in uh, gold mining knows what this means. Is that uh, the pools are where the gold is going to collect because that's the low spot in the river. And theoretically, they should be periodically placed along the bottom of the river. It's reasonably periodically placed at the same distance in between. Now, in this view here, the one in the dead center, which is long, if I just move that plane a little bit, it disconnects into two. And then what you have is the pools. You'll have one, two, three, four, five, six of them. Don't count the one up to the top right because it's in a bin. But there'll be six of them there, different shapes. But they are periodically placed, and they are roughly 175 feet apart, going from right down to left downstream. Well, that's very satisfying. Uh, that's what we want to see because in plaster mining, as anybody as anybody's ever dealt with a plaster mine, you cannot drill ahead, you cannot establish resources or anything because the plaster gold is irregularly distributed. And so, which what, what you really want which is very difficult to get, is some sort of control on what you should be seeing as you mine into a new area. One of the things I wanted to establish with the high resolution survey was exactly what you're seeing here, was a curiosity of the pools in the bottom of the channel. And at least in this stretch, excuse me, in this straight part of the channel, um, starting at middle right, going to the left, and we have 2,000 feet to the left that we haven't mined downstream. It looks like we can count on the pools of being about 175 feet apart, spaced going downstream, as long as the stream is reasonably straight. When you start getting into bends, like up at the top right up there, it gets a little more complicated and the gradient is different. But that, so that was pretty satisfactory. Now, theoretically, pools are related, that, excuse me, the distance between pools are related to the width of the channel. And, and they're supposed to be spaced about six to seven times the width of the channel. So if your channel is 100 feet wide, they should be 700 feet apart. Well, that's not happening here. My channel is less than 100 feet wide, and they're 175 feet apart. So theory is not working here, but it's working in our favor because I would rather have pools 175 feet apart than 700 feet apart. So, that's the first thing I got out of this. Now, and going back to this map again, stage two of this was to get the geology out of it. Now, when I started doing the surveying, it was right after I got here, I had, when it came to the rocks underground, I had absolutely no idea what I was looking at. Uh, the miners were showing me the basal gravels, the upper gravels, and all this stuff. I had no clue what I was looking at. And so I knew it was premature to do geology, and the best thing to do is just do the dumb stuff first, didn't take any brain work, and go do the surveying. So I did, I did the surveying, and in the process of that, I had, I had lots of time to look at the rocks and get, get my brain focused. Now, when I did the geology under there, the plan was is to go throughout the mine workings, as you see, and basically record a sedimentary column, which was just in my notebook, a real quick drawing of here's the basement and then with a tape measure measured in tens of inches I would measure the thickness of the bottom of the basal gravel the next layer above it the next layer above it and the next layer above it if, if, if I had two or three layers and just record it in a very quickly and but I didn't want to have to measure the elevation at the point that I did the geology I didn't want to have to go mark it on the wall and go through there and do the surveying all over again. So the, so the idea of using LeapFrog was the fact that my elevation data gave me a continuous surface through all of my elevation points. Then when I, uh, and all of those points were marked on, this, on the map that you see here and extracted. Now when I did my geology, I took the same map, same map, new copy of it and every place I recorded geology would be a dot on that map and I could I could extract the X Y excuse me the X and Y location looking down and all I needed to do in leapfrog was then to create a pseudo drill hole 
and say a constant elevation of say 200 feet above the workings and project a drill hole vertically downward to my elevation surface, which I just showed you with all the green, the shaded relief surface with all the green points. And so I could shoot my points down from where I did my geology and intercept that surface and leapfrog would return to me the exact elevation on that surface, uh, uh, saving me the step of having to measure it underground. That's the beauty of leapfrog is that the surfaces are mathematical objects, so the, so the interpolation between known points is very accurate. So all I had to do is go any place I wanted in that mine, and including areas that I could not survey in, which I could not get a survey instrument in there, but I had points around me, so I knew that the interpolated elevation in, the, in those workings were good. And so I just went through the mine completely arbitrary and measured all of my geology points and then extracted the elevations from my elevation surface. Pretty clever, if I do say so myself. Uh, and in my geology, in the map that you see there, I extracted about, or I recorded about 220 locations of the geology. Now, back to what the geology is in that study area. A little bit different from what we saw up there in the Lowry area. Back to a stratigraphic section. There's some similarities. One, we have, starting at the bottom, we have the Paleozoic slates, which are the same. We have the boulder gravel with the gold in it, which is the same. Then, the big change down there, which, which caused me a lot of thinking and completely, or led to a complete reinterpretation of the geology of the Black Channel and from what was done before is the fact that there are trees growing, there were trees growing in the bottom of this channel as you see there, that's a tree. And that was quite interesting to look at that because I had to wrap the geology around that thing. I'll talk about that for a few minutes, but let's look at the rocks first. Above the boulder layer you have what is called a chocolate layer. Or which is a water-laid volcanic took. The chocolate layer was even recognized by Lindgren, and it is regional in extent. It occurs over hundreds of square miles, and what it is is a fine, very, very fine grain andesitic took that was blown out of a volcano and dropped as a layer, like an ash layer, all over the region. In the ruby mine, it's from zero to three feet thick. It's dark red or dark brown red oxidized and is water laid most of the places. Now, um, our, our uh, retired professor Larry Larson at uh, University of Nevada, Reno, did the photography on the chocolate layer for me, uh, micro microscope work and interpretation, and some work on the upper, upper sand layer up in the higher in this column. And after much agonizing and, and uh, looking at it because it's so fine grained, he concluded that it was a asphalt took that had been remobilized by water, basically washed in by rainwater, overflow of a channel or a river, and picked up off the surface. And it would have been just an ash layer, very sooty, uh, dusty type of rock, and then redeposited as a very, uh, as a very thin banded uh, sedimentary layer uh, within within the within the mine working, which of course is, it's all over the place. We even find it exposed at the surface, but within the mine working. And anyway, it's called the chocolate layer, and it is distinctive because it is always on top of the basal boulder gravel. If you're above it, uh, there's all kinds of gravels, but there's no gold in them. Now. Above the chocolate layer is either going to be one of two things, which is going to be a fine anisinic sand, uh, which is in yellow, or this red oxidized cobble gravel, the same one that you find up in the Lowry. In the Lowry area, though, we have that, um, we have the debris flow. We do not have that here. No indication of that at all. And in the rhyolite fragments, the schist fragments and stuff, we do not see any of that here even though it's a mile away, so a mile and a half away. So we've got some interesting geology to try to reconcile that. But the 
the sand layer, uh, it can be there, or the gravel layer. They are kind of they're interdigitating, interdigitating their four to, four to, you know, generally about four feet thick or so. And there they're well-rounded, uh, andesite, cobble, gravel, uh, class-supported primarily. And these grade up into uh, a sand layer, a coarse sand layer, which does have another carbon layer in there, just like over at the Lowry, which is a, uh, basically it's the same sand, but it's just full of carbon debris, burnt logs and twigs and leaves and stuff, up into a coarse bedded, somewhat cross bedded coarse sand, and above that, an andesite lahar. We have no idea how deep, deep that it, well, basically that goes right up to the surface. Now, let's coming back to this tree thing. The tree, and this has everything to do, the tree is not geology, but the tree is what interprets, what forces the interpretation of the geology on this channel. The tree is, and there's lots of them in the channel, most of them are down, but they are still standing. And I'll show you a picture of that. And some of them are up to two feet in diameter. So here we have, the trees were growing out of the bottom of the slate, and they went and they grow right through the bottom gravel. The chocolate layer wraps around them, and then these upper gravels wrap around them, and then the upper sands wrap around them. So what does that tell you? That tells you that when these rocks were laid down, uh, the sedimentary environment was quiet. This was not a rushing river. It was they flowed in very softly. They didn't knock the trees over. It's very likely that the trees grew after the boulder layer, the lower boulder layer where the gold was laid down. It just grew up through it because that layer is not very thick. And, but after that, they're standing there. They didn't, and, and so how did this happen? You have, you have a river that if you just look at the boulder layer, and some of those boulders are three feet in diameter. It was a, there wasn't much of them laying down, but that there was some pretty decent water that came down. And you cannot have a tree growing in the middle of a river like that. Maybe up to the side, but not in the middle of it. So you have to look at that. You say, how in the hell could, how in the heck could that happen? And my conclusion was, is that that tree grew in there after the river dried up. We had the boulder layer was laid down. And then, if you see the line on the top of the boulder layer, it says disconformity. A disconformity means a hiatus or a break in the sedimentary record that basically everything dried up and nothing was being laid down. No, no rocks, sand, or anything was being laid down. And in effect, the river dried up. And dried up for a considerable period of time the fact that trees started growing in it. And then at a later time, and that break in time could have been thousands of years. I mean, that isn't the only tree that grew there. Uh, there could have been many generations of trees that grew there. And at some other time, then the river or the channel, not so much the river, material started to be redeposited in the river channel. In the case, in this case, the first was the chocolate layer, this very fine water laid took. And they just wrapped around the tree and of course killed the tree. And the tree may have been killed because really the new sedimentation came with the onset of volcanism. So very likely that you had massive forest fires that went through this whole area, cooked everything, and that tree was just charred cinder um, or cooked and killed. Uh, and then sediments just came in around it. But the very interesting thing is, is that down at the boulder gravel, we had a river that was depositing boulders with gold in it. And then it stopped. The river stopped, which means not that the river dried up, but the river went somewhere else. So the question is, where did it go? And where is it? And right now we don't know if the river might have been cut off by volcanic activity. Maybe it did. But the little bit of ge geologic evidence that I have, and it comes from the mapping, geologic mapping that Randy Hinkle and Tim Sandberg did up in the Lowry shaft where we just were looking up there, although they weren't looking at this problem. I'm kind of reading between the lines what they did. There's an indication that the black channel was cut off up there somewhere, maybe by the debris flow, and was routed out of there. It took another path 
in across somewhere across the Ruby property and went somewhere else in an area that we haven't had access to yet, maybe going right over the top of the Ruby attic. Uh, very likely. And so the Black Channel, after the laying down of these boulders, was rerouted somewhere, either from a landslide, volcanic activity, or something. It surely was, it kept going, and it surely kept depositing rocks and gold. So we have wherever the, what we call now the new Black Channel is, we don't know, but it's a target on the property. And so anyway, that's what this tree told us. If that tree wasn't there, it would have been more difficult to understand what's going on. But the story is, is that the lower part of the Black Channel, the channel was abandoned. In geologic parlance, that means that the channel was rerouted. The water was rerouted somewhere else to another river. So I'm going to show you examples of this strategic tree now. Uh, well, before I do that, I am going to show you these various layers as I extracted them. I'll show you the pictures of the rocks in a minute. But the first thing I'm going to do show you is some of the geology that I extracted through the process I told you before, where I, I did the little stratigraphic sections all over the mine, got their elevations, and by projecting downward to the topographic surface. This is the plan view. And this shows you the thickness of the lower gravel layer, which is the layer that contains the gold and which it sits on the bottom of the channel. And the red is relative thickness. Where it is blue, it does not exist. So what you're looking at are patches of gravel sitting on the bottom of the riverbed, periodically placed, but interestingly, uh, not necessarily in the pools. The pools are the black things that you see. They're a little bit different from the one I showed you before. But um, in each of those, uh, well, starting at the very top right, there is a black space, and it could be expanded, and it's, up, it's on a different gradient. Then coming downstream, there's a black spot right in the middle of that big area of gravel. Then there's a great dead center in the where the right in the middle of the scene. There's a great big black thing there, but it wraps around a deposit of gravel. So the gravel is higher than the pool. And there's uh, then there's the next pool, and the gravel is not in it, except for at each end there's a little indication of gravel because it's in yellow and green. And then the next two pools down below do have gravel in them. Now, the size of the pools and the deposit of the gravel are going to be not the same because of uh, what measurements could be taken in those various workings. Uh, so, but they basically are correlated. But what it shows is that the gravel, the basal gravel, is deposited in, is basically deposited in deposits, uh, going downstream, kind of periodically placed patches of it. Uh, the thickness, the maximum thickness is about three feet. And it grades out very quickly into zero feet. It doesn't even exist in the blue areas. Uh, so this is where uh, the gold is going to be found, is in that gravel. It's not going to be necessarily found in the pools, which is something I'm still struggling with. Uh, there is, I don't need to get into, into hydraulics, but there is a reason for this sometimes. But... What we're seeing here is that the gold is not necessarily, or the gold, which of course is correlated with the basal gravels, is not necessarily in the pools, maybe just adjacent to it. But the gravels themselves that contain the gold are periodically placed. So that's the lower gravel. And looking at it in three dimensions, here's the lower gravel, and I'm looking upstream on the topographic surface that I determined from the elevation points. And the same thing you just saw, but I just curved it, and I'm looking upstream, and you'll see that the patches are periodically placed coming downstream. Now, the important thing about this one, though, looking at the top right up in the northeast corner of you know, this scene, it's not northeast, actually, you see some gravel perched way up high up there. That's about 20 to 30 vertical feet above the bottom of the channel. Remember, there's vertical accentuation 
uh, on this channel. And all those little black dots are my geologic points where I did measurements. So that thing is sitting up high there. And uh, so we're starting to get the idea that maybe we're getting some terraces, that there are some terraces associated with this channel. Uh, you probably figured that out already, but that becomes an important item in my talk as we go. So the layer, this is the next layer. Looking down, this is the chocolate layer sitting over the top of the, it's either sitting on the chocolate, excuse me, it's either sitting on the basement or it's sitting on that basal gravel. Remember, the gravel's not everywhere, the chocolate's not everywhere. And what you see here is big patches of this asphalt hook, which has been washed into this thing. And there doesn't seem to be any real correlation between the pools on the bottom of the channel. It's not periodic. You get the sense that in the middle right there, it's coming in from the top of the scene, coming in from top to bottom. Because it's, it's present at the edge, but on the bottom edge, in the middle of the scene there, it pinches out. And, and we have uh, a lot of areas where it doesn't exist at all. It's just all over the place. So if we look at it in... Three dimensions, my interpretation was consistent with what I showed you in the stratigraphic section is that the channel after the basal gravels had been laid down went dry, it ceased to exist as a river channel, trees grew up in it, so everything that came after that wasn't washed in by, it, by water coming down the channel, they came in from somewhere else. And if you look at the pattern of the chocolate layer, and I'm looking upstream, you get the sense that it looks like, at least on the bottom part of the channel, closer to us, that it came washing in from the side. It came in over, the, over the rim of the channel, in this case from left to right, which is from north to south, if we're looking off to the east right now, and came pouring in into the channel. And the way that you, in, in where you see this underground is, if you look at the upper arrow, if you were to go underground and look at the chocolate layer, where the arrow is, it's about four feet thick, or where the red starts, about four feet thick, and you go over to the right on the other side of the channel, and it pinches out. It's not filling the channel. It's asymmetric. It lays in the channel asymmetrically. It's thick on the, on the left side as we're looking at it, and thins and just pinches out on the right side. And if you go up channel, up to the middle channel, you see a patch there in the middle, and it's sitting on the left-hand side of the channel, kind of sloping up to the left, and pinches out right, right up against the right-hand side of the channel. This is an indication that the channel was, at this point, was not a flowing river. It was basically a depression in the basement. It was just a, just a little valley, no water flowing in it, maybe full of trees and stuff, oh, now cooked, you know, burnt out. And the chocolate layer just started to flow in it. it remember, the chocolate layer this took was deposited as a layer everywhere, for miles in every direction. So a little bit of rain or something like that, or whatever, uh, would wash, would remobilize this dusty material into any low spots. And I think that's what we're looking at here, is basically the channel, it only had a few feet of gravel on the bottom of it. It was a low spot, and it became a repository for any unconsolidated sediment that could be washed into it. I think there's pretty good evidence for that. Now, the fact that it's coming from left to right, that tells us something, and uh, that's some interpretation and, uh, that I have to be looking at. Now, finally, looking up at top right, you see where I have it, look, I have it uh, labeled as airfall. That's way up high. That's up on a bench up there. Uh, that this, I haven't looked at that in too much detail, but there's not too much of an indication that was washed in. That may actually be air fall up there, this remnant. But another indication that you've got a bench up there above the main river channel, a terrace. Now, finally, the third layer that I measured was this upper gravel, this cobble gravel that is oxidized, primarily volcanic activity, excuse me, volcanic rocks. Plan view, uh, again, patches of it in red, 
all over the place, no indication that it's periodically placed in the channel, just here and there. But unlike in thick sections now on the bottom of the scene rather than the top of the scene. Uh, and so something different. So if we go This is a three-dimensional rendition of the upper gravels uh, on the image that I've shown before at the bottom of the channel looking upstream. And what you see here is that the, the red, which is where the gravels are thickest, blue is where they do, where they are pinched out and are not present. Very clear that the gravels have come into the, into the channel uh, depression from the sides. Up there at top left, you have a pouring in uh, through a, near, uh, a thin area. Uh, bottom left, pretty much the same. Very interesting, and over on the right, where the right arrow is, you have a real influx of gravel. This is in a low area of the, of the channel. Uh, it's unclear why it is so low. It almost looks like there was a tributary that was coming in from the south, which is to the right. And then up the top right, I don't have an arrow there, but it appears that the gravels have basically flow, uh, flowed into the depression from the top right down over the uh, escarpment there where there is a, uh, a bench, a terrace up there, and just piled up on the bottom. So this makes it pretty clear that this was not a running river at the time. It was simply a depression in the landscape and it is being slowly filled by sediments of different types. This is the one picture I have of something that looks like the older Eocene age gravel. This is actually a mixture of, of the two. Uh, what you see are big fragments of some angular and some rounded quartz boulders. Uh, they look, some of them look pretty angular because they've been blasted in half. But the quartz like this only comes from the older Eocene channels. Uh, we don't see much quartz at all, at least within the ruby mine, uh, of quartz in the Oligocene age, older, uh, younger gravels. But in this case here, you have a mixture of the two. A lot of the material here is a andesitic sand with andesitic boulders. This is an example of where a Oligocene channel has pirated uh, a older Oligocene channel and the two gravels have been mixed together. Uh, this is up in the white channel where we're mining now, extracting gravel. So we're going to see a mixture of, which will be kind of atypical of uh, what has been mined in the past and the ruby mine, of more quartz rich material. Uh, so I, that's the only example I do have of uh, the older quartz rich gravels. There we go. So, I'm going to look at the cystigraphy of the lower black channel. Here is the sort of the Rosetta Stone picture of the lower black channel. At the top center of the picture, you see a tree hanging down. It is hanging down. It went right down to the mine layer, but of course we mined through here, but the upper part of it was kept intact. But that's about a six inch diameter tree standing vertically that went down to the basement rocks, which are where my hammer is. It's those are the shales, they're, they're altered here. But it grew right out of those shales and went it was straight up there. And then at a later time, the chocolate layer, which is that reddish, shiny layer behind you that the water laid took, wrapped around that tree so gently that it didn't knock it over. And then the upper gravels and sands, which you see at the top of the scene up there, above the chocolate layer, they wrapped around it and didn't knock the tree over either. We see this repeatedly through the mine. Now, there was another place where I have a, a tree two feet in diameter, but it's back in workings that are too dangerous to, to climb into, to get a camera into. But this is, you know, when you're looking at these rocks, if you've got a tree standing there, you, you have to do some reconciling about what the heck is going on. And my story is based on, my interpretation is the story that I presented. But here we have a very nice shot of the chocolate layer. The, the lower gravels here are not here. Uh, right at this spot. I'll show you those in a minute. But the chocolate layer shows it is now lithified. It has conchoidal fracture. It's soft, uh, but you can see micro laminations all through it. 
that you do not see any sedimentary texture such as cross bedding or scouring in it except at the microscopic level. It is extraordinarily fine grain. Uh, Dr. Larry Larson had a real time trying to interpret it. What was interesting, it is full of organic uh, fragments. It, it, it washed across the landscape that had been burnt up, picked up tremendous amounts of very, very small fragments of organic material, burnt organic material, and incorporated that. That becomes part of the matrix of it. And it was laid down sheet by sheet like a thin slurry, like a soup. Uh, and and I, I can't, it's hard to give an analogy except for like at the hot springs at Yellowstone Park where you have water that is flowing across the surface. It's just a millimeter thick and it has a little bit of suspended matter in it and it basically starts building up a deposit. And that's what I thought, I think, was happening here, that you had sheet flood uh, material from a breached river with the very finest material coming out or just sheet flood anyway of rain or something coming across the landscape. Very thin layers, picking up sand and twip and organic matter and dropping it down uh, very, very, in a, in very, very thin layer. Okay. This is a picture of one, two, three, four layers. This is the stratigraphy of the mine. You have the basal slates, um, Paleozoics, where my hammer is, where and below my hammer, where my hammer is, you see this triangular wedge. That is the basal gravels. That's the gold bearing layer. That layer changes from sand to huge boulders. It just depends where you are in the mine, and that's a separate measurement that I've made that I have not yet rendered into uh, a diagram. Uh, but it changes. Above that you have the chocolate layer which is here about a foot and a half thick. It's reddish and grayish and you can see, which is interesting, how the basal gravel pinches out from right to left. It just pinches out and the chocolate layer lays right down on top of the basement. This is an example. Uh, we're we're on, the, on the south side of the channel and as the channel rises, the side of the channel, the rim rises to our left, the basal gravel pinches out because it is a water-laid sediment in the low spots. And as you, as you go up the side of the channel, obviously, you're going to get out of the low spot. Gravels are not going to be there. And then the, but however, so the basal gravel has a flat top to it, but the chocolate layer keeps going and starts rising up the other side goes right up the side of the channel. Well, how can that be? Anything that is laid down uh, in a in a bottom of a lake or in a running river, river is going to have a flat top to it. When you have the chocolate layer like this rising up the side of the rim like that, that's the indication that that was washed in from the rim, from the side of the river into it, is a very fine slurry, like a soup, and laid down. And then on top of that, up in the top left, you have the oxidized upper gravel uh, layer, which is quite different from the basal gravels. So that's your basic stigraphy. Above, above the gravel, sometimes you'll see the sand unit, and I will show you that. I'm going to show you a number of shots of the basal gravel. Here's the three layers again. Below my hammer is the slates. Then you have this wedge of basal gravel, which may or may not have gold in it, but you can see that on the top of the gravel there is no erosional surface. That the chocolate layer comes in there and imperceptibly, or the gravels imperceptibly appear to grade into the chocolate layer. But there is a, there is a time gap in there. And basically what the chocolate layer has done is just come on top of the basal gravels and then filled in all the little holes and stuff. That's the disconformity. The unconformity is the erosional surface at the base of my pick. The disconformity is the dip is the is the the timeline between the gravels, the up the basal gravels, and the bottom of the chocolate layer. Another shot of the basal gravels. 
the base, the, uh, the Paleozoic slates below my pick. Uh, and then you have this poorly sorted, almost chaotic matrix or, or mess of basal gravels overlaid by the chocolate layer. Where here it's about a foot and a half feet thick. You can see some imbrication in the gravels. They are laying over to your right. So the basic flow of the water was from left to right. But it's poorly, very poorly sorted, matrix supported. Excuse me, it is class supported here in this case, sometimes matrix supported, but primarily class supported, uh, very irregular, high energy, big rocks. Okay, this is another shot of the basal gravels. I'll show half a dozen here, just to, uh, because this is, of course, great interest to anybody who is interested in gold in this mine. This is the whole purpose of this. Uh, another example of a kind of a chaotic mixture of pretty decent sized gravels. Uh, the basement is below my hammer, of course, and the chocolate layers at the top of the scene. Uh, if you look at the very top left, you'll see a boulder, which is part of the lower gravels, sticking up into the chocolate layer. And close examination, you'll see that the, you can't see it here, but the chocolate layer wraps around that boulder. It doesn't go over the top, it wraps around it. Another indication that that is a disconformity, that the basal that the chocolate layer laid down layer by layer and just wrapped around anything that was on top or was that formed the top surface of the basal gravels. Um, imbrication here, the laying over the gravels is again left to right. Uh, they're laying over to the right so the direction of flow of, this, of the river here was from left to right. Scene. Okay, this is quite interesting. This is what this is a an outcrop or type of outcrop that the miners showed me over and over again, and it and it did it took a while for me to sink in. Now, I must say that the colors in a camera shot like this, where you have a flash, are a lot easier to tell than if you're looking at it because down there everything looks the same. The gravel, the shales are not blue, and the gravels are not red like you see here. <laughs> However, boy, it took me a while, but what I'm looking at here is the lower gravels with the upper gravel sitting right on top of them. And the way you see the difference is right where my hammer is, the lower gravels are kind of a grayish, sandier, uh, slightly purplish color, about 10 inches thick. And on top of that are these coarser, poorly sorted, wet, oxidized cobble gravel and that's the difference uh, sometimes the gravels have almost the same consistency the same sort of rocks the same size of rocks and things like this but the lower gravels which again there is a time difference between the upper and the lower of what we don't know and it'd be nice if somebody date that for me uh, the lower gravels are slightly lithified uh, they are harder uh, they're, they are filled full of sand. There's no spaces or voids in them. Uh, that's the, the denser, more purplish colored, sandier layer that you see there. And then when you get in the upper gravels, they're full of voids. It's easy to knock those rocks out. It's, they're, they're less consolidated and cemented. Um, and that's the difference. But I'll tell you, and so some of the work I did underground is where the where these two met and just trying to identify the lower gravels was a challenge sometimes, but it was very critical because where I did see this was mainly up in where it appeared to be a terrace area. Uh, so anyway, next scene, another example of the lower gravel. We can get some pretty sizable rocks in there. The largest I've seen are about six feet in diameter, although that's very uncommon. And here we have a couple of monster boulders laying there and uh, in the lower gravel layer and at the very top of the scene you see some kind of little shiny cobbles that's the upper gravel layer the chocolate layer does not exist here and it's and these big guys are sitting right on this basement which is really quite smooth at this location it's not all broken up and some places the basement is is basically just polished flat with a few little undulations in them 
Another scene close by, this was a particularly rich area. That's a window that's been broken into a uh, stope in behind there. Uh, we're looking at a pillar. If you were to take these rocks out right here, the whole world would fall in on you, and they're left there. But uh, the around us, behind us, where I'm taking the shot, in and around through that window and behind, it's quite open. It's all been mined out because it was very rich. And here you see these gigantic boulders laying in here, the chocolate layer, is no excuse me the upper gravel layer is up there at the very top and again if you look at the surface of the shale right under my hammer you can see it's kind of smooth there are bumps and dents in it and the rocks of course have worked their way down in there but here the gold would be in the upper foot above the, of my hammer layer another shot uh, basement below my hammer, about two feet of gravel, and then the chocolate layer above. Uh, here you have some big boulders in there, not real apparent. The imbrication is not real clear. A lot of sandy material. But if, if you remember of all the shots we've seen in lower gravel, you do not see any quartz. You don't see any big quartz boulders. That's the difference. In an Eocene channel, it would be full of quartz boulders. Here you see none. This is primarily intervolcanic. And we have to make the, it, however, I have done thin sections or poly sections on the sand matrix in the lower gravels here. It is full of ground up quartz. So the original philosophy in the mine was, is that the gold was in the lower, in the lower gravels here, uh, in the black channel, the gold was robbed from the older quartz rich oligocene or eocene channels. I don't buy that. Uh, this river went over the same rocks, which were replete with quartz veins. Uh, I'm sure it liberated its gold from the same rocks independently of what happened millions of years before in the Eocene channels. Now, we do have a few places in the workings where we're seeing rocks, quartz boulders coming into the black channel up, up the rim, up, up high up off the rim, which would suggest that there may be terraces up there of oligocene. Uh, gravels, I'm sorry, I keep getting my oligocenes and eocene, of eocene quartz rich gravels up there, that would be very good. Uh, the miners saw that in a few places and they cross cut and they did incline raises uh, looking for it, but they never did go far enough, didn't have the money or the time to really discover anything up on the rims. But uh, I noticed that the first day I was down there looking at these gravels and once one or two places in the mine I, I started seeing quartz gravel coming in. Uh, it was primarily in the upper gravels, not in the lower gravels. And uh, lo and behold, there would be some workings indicating that the miners back in the 30s and 40s saw the same thing, and they went chasing it as well, looking for perched Eocene quartz-rich gravels that might be up on the rim of the Black Channel. And another shot of the lower gravels. Here they are... Uh, Actually, this is not the lower gravels. This is an interesting shot. These are the upper gravels. And right there where my pick is, you see the chocolate layer pinching out. It comes in at about six or eight inches thick, sitting on top of the basement, coming in from the right, and pinches out right there where my pick point is. This is an example of the uh, right in the middle of the channel where... 100 feet away from me, the, the chocolate layer may be 4 feet thick, and it just pinches out. Another indication that it, fl it came flowing in laterally, not down laterally into the channel, not down the axis of the channel. Uh, all of the rocks you see here are the gravels. These are the upper upper gravels. Uh, lower gravels don't exist. Uh, another shot of the lower gravels, very similar to what I showed you before. This has a lot of organic matter in it. Uh, the chocolate layer here is a different color. It has quite a bit of organic matter. I'll show you that in a minute. And here's an excellent shot of that. We have the basement below us. There is no basal gravel here. We have above my hammerhead is a mixture of sand, coarse sand, full of, of organic detritus, 
and grading up into the chocolate layer, which you can see there's about six, eight inches thick. And that is overlain by the upper gravels, which are thoroughly oxidized, uh, well sorted, mostly andesite, almost no quartz. Um, in this, uh, we did a thin section here uh, of the chocolate layer, and it is full of organic matter. Now, right where I'm standing, in that previous slide, I turned my camera up and I looked up at the sand because this, this is a place where we have the upper sand layer, which I haven't shown many times, sitting on top of the upper gravel. And here is the what we call the carbon layer, which is at the base of the upper sands. And here you have, uh, by scale, you can see the rock bolt hanging from the roof on the right. And you have a limb of a tree or something. It's all cooked and uh, hang in there and, and the whole sand layer up there just full of organic matter like a bunch of charcoal which is exactly what it is and uh, finally here is what the gradation between the upper gravel and the upper sand looks like in the middle part behind the mats you have the or you have the um, basically a mixture of the upper sand uh, with the upper oxidized cobble gravel and then grading up into a coarse sand layer which will have may or may not have some organic matter in it. The thickness of the upper sand we don't know. Uh, we the It is overlain by the andesite lahar uh, which goes through to the surface hundreds and hundreds of feet thick. We don't know how thick this layer is. I'm guessing it might be 10 or 20 feet thick. Okay. Get your attention again. This young lady is uh, a typical, beautiful young lady from Burma. This is in the town of Turantari in southern Burma, where I was six months ago looking at some uh, tin flasters. And she has the uh, ground up root on her face, which is traditional there. It's on her cheeks. All Burmese wear that. Uh, they say it's to keep the cheeks from being sunburned, but it's more tradition. Um, okay, what type of river are we looking at in the Black Channel? Now, this is before the Black Channel dried up and trees grew in it. So I, we, we want to get back to an analogy here to understand. And, and I'll be the first to admit that now that I've started looking at these channels, I look at every river that I see, every stream, every picture, I look at it completely differently. Okay, here's, here's an example of a river of about the right size. Uh, this is the River Kwai in Western Thailand. I'm looking upstream towards Burma, now Myanmar. If you go downstream to my left about 20 miles, you will encounter the bridge on the River Kwai. I'm looking, this view is from the Death Railroad, which is still exists for about another, about 30, 35 miles above the river. Anyway, it's about the right, width and depth. It's probably only six or eight feet depth. And, but this is a what's called suspension load river. The sediment is being carried in suspension. It's always muddy and sandy like this. And we don't, you know, have to wonder, is this a good analogy? Here we are down on the river. We're on a floating hotel of which meant that there are many along the river banks. Uh, my wife and I stayed here for a few nights. Here the river is about 80 to 100 feet thick, probably thick width in width. It's only probably eight feet deep or so maybe. And it has a heavy suspension of sand. It is cutting through bedrock. The bedrock is hidden behind the trees, but it's limestone. Uh, it's not flowing across on a river plain or anything. It's actually down cutting. But the question is, is this river going to have a bed of boulders on the bottom of it like we see in the Paleo Black Channel? Probably not. Because this river, when it does flood, and it's in flood now, is going slowly. I mean, the, in this case, the uh, here one of the great attractions here is that the hotel will put you in a boat, take you upstream a couple of miles, and then you jump in the river with a life jacket, and you float down the river for miles and miles. It's It only goes four or five miles an hour. So it's really not the type of river that's going to be moving boulders six feet in diameter. We want to look at rivers that are down cutting through bedrock. That's what's exactly happening at the Black Channel. And then that's not so 
common. I mean, if you, I've looked at thousands of images of rivers on Google, and there's not that many down cutting through bedrock. They're mostly up on floodplains. Well, this is a river in Newfoundland, and it's coming towards you, obviously, and uh, it's cutting down through bedrock, uh, and it's about the right width. And so maybe this is analogous to what we're looking at. So we look at a few more. Uh, the thing about it, it is, is that we have an indication that the black channel uh, wasn't very deep uh, and it dried up. And the what you do not see in it is interesting. You do not see exotic rocks in it. I'll show you examples of this. Uh, in the black channel below, in the last pictures I showed you, there's never any big, high, big angular rocks like they fell off the side of the creek or off the side of the river or anything. It, uh, it may have been something more like this. Uh, a slow-moving river most of the time. Maybe something like this. This is the Klamath River up in southern Oregon. And this river here has rounded gravel, rounded boulders in it. It's cutting down through bedrock. Does not have a lot of angular exotic material in it. And it's interesting is that this triangle in the middle of the scene, you can see stacks of gravel along the edge of that little nose sticking out there. Well, those are gravels that have been plastered. That the river was higher once upon a time and it's cut down and the terrace has been, uh, is perched up there and there was river gravel on it. Now, of the many scenes I studied of, of rivers like this that had about the right size rocks in them, the difference between those that had mostly or almost exclusively rounded boulders in them, as opposed to those that had angular rocks in them, was the degree of vegetation. You can have very steep terrain like this with ragged rocks where the, right, where the river is cutting down. If you have a lot of vegetation, that seems to be the difference if you're going to see angular boulders in the bottom of the river. So, it's kind of an indication that the Black Channel, at least the bottom part of it, was an area that was heavily vegetated because there were no angular rocks. In I'm thinking that the Black Channel, for most of the time, the area that we just looked at, it looked a lot like this most of the time. Those rocks on the bottom, you can see they're imbricated, they're pointing downstream, they're about the right size. There's no big, massive, huge boulders. There's no angular material. The only difference here is it's not cutting down through bedrock. But I'm thinking that this is what, and, and these rocks, the big rocks you see here in this type of the stream, only come in here periodically during flood. Flooding may occur once every couple of years. Big rocks are moved down, but most of the time, the river is quiet. So, I came to the conclusion that this is probably what the Black Channel looked like. Uh, it was, this is just uh, an upper part of the Yuba River above Downeyville. And it may have looked like this. These are about the right size of rocks. Uh, there's a layer in them here that sits on the bedrock. You can see the bedrock right there in left center, uh, left corner, lower corner. And so the gravel layer here is only a couple of feet thick. Uh, you got some big rocks in there and a lot of small ones. This isn't completely analogous. The river is about the right size and width, and if in around the corner, and, and it's cutting down through bedrock. So, and it's well vegetated. You don't see any angular material in this thing. And these rocks are moved in here only during flood. Most of the time, these rocks are just sitting here in a pool of water. Uh, you know, maybe a couple of feet of water. Uh, and then every now and then you have a flood, and here come the gold nuggets, and here come the rocks, and they roll around, and they pile up, and that's it. Now, another indication that the Black Channel was abandoned is the fact that if you look at this stream here, you'll see that these rocks, of course, are sitting in water, whereas the gravels in the Black Channel are surrounded, they are encased in sand and silt, but not silt, but sand and smaller rocks. It would be more akin as if you dried that stream up right now and then natural erosion from down the stream and from the flanks fill the river full of sand just from natural silt and sand and stuff and just fill in around and bury the rocks. And uh, or in the latter days of the river, 
uh, before it was rerouted, you had an influx of sand and smaller rocks. And all those rocks there that you see were encased in a layer right up to the top of uh, basically compacted, it's surrounded by sand and silt and things like that. Because in the black channel, the next layer that came in, the chocolate layer, did not fall in between the rocks. It laid on a solid layer of boulders cemented together with sand and smaller rocks. So it appears that would, it probably looked something like this. And also notice very, very importantly, there's no trees growing in the middle of this river. And the reason is, is that this is a this is a bed load river. It means that the rocks are carried intermittently by flood. No plant, no tree can exist in that riverbed there for more than a year or two before it is wiped out. That's the other indication. You do not have a river that looks like that with a tree growing in the middle of it. It won't last. So another indication that the river dried up and, and basically was rerouted to another place and eventually had volcanic activity and the scene that you have there started to get infilled with water-laid tuff, gravels, sand, and then eventually was buried 500 deep with volcanic uh, andesitic lahar. So finally, exploration. All of this good data, what do we do with it? Uh, this is a scene six years ago in Saudi Arabia. This is my Arab brother, Sheikh Abdullah al-Jahani. He is a Bedouin, lives up on the Red Sea and lived in a compound with his two mothers and 15 brothers and sisters over the, around the corner of us, about half a mile away. I, I could not venture into the camp because the women were out. Uh, of course, they were all decked in black, but it is improper for me to go into the camp and surprise them with the women out open, even though they were decked in black. But my, uh, he, of, of the 15 brothers and sisters, he was elect, elected Czech of his tribe and uh, uh, spoke English, and we became great buds. Uh, he would follow me around the desert when I was doing my mapping. I was working there on a zinc project. And uh, I'd very much like to go back to Saudi Arabia to visit uh, Abdullah. Okay, in exploration, we have two targets in the ruby mine. Here we're back to the original scene of all the channels. The ruby mine there is at center left, and we're looking north. These are the buried channels. The, they are buried under the purple stuff, which is the andesite lahar. Obviously, where they are not buried, uh, they exited out onto the surface and have been eroded away. Uh, remnants of these channels were found out in the open, uh, out there on the tertiary, uh, basically out there on the Paleozoic surface, which is the white and they were washed away, and they, they were hydraulic away. So within the, my, within the property, we've got miles of, un, uh, we have these channels. Now, we don't have the budget, and in some cases, it's just not practical to be doing geophysics looking for these things, and we cannot drill very handily. It's in National Forest. We do have a gravity survey now going on to test how deeply we can see with microgravity. But one thing that I, again, learned from the miners, that if within the, ch within the ruby adit, which is the red there that goes back in there about a mile and a half, if a channel goes over the top of you, and it could be up there 40 feet above you, um, remember, the channel is in the slates. The slates may be 40 feet thick or 100 feet thick above you before you get into the tertiary unconformity where you then get into gravels and volcanic material. Well, when they go over the top of you, the miners pointed out something that I uh, probably wouldn't have paid much attention to, and that is this. And the point of what I'm trying to show you is that we have channels that are apparently going right over the top of the ruby at it that we could drill, get in, uh, you know, verify they're there, and just raise vertically from the ruby at it up 40 feet, 60 feet, uh, 80 feet, directly straight up. And if they have gold in them, we mine them. We don't have to go searching around all over this property. We don't have to put any shafts or inclines. We don't have to do anything very spectacular at all except drill some holes and, and find them. And here's what you look for in the ruby atom. <clears throat> this is back in about a mile. When you're in the ruby at it, mostly the shale, which you see here, is dry. 
there's no stalagmite, tights, whatever the heck these things are, anywhere, and there's no water. It's dry. The miners pointed out that, and based on their experience from working in lots of drift mines, underground channel mines like this, that when you see this, when you're sufficiently back there in the rock that you're not looking at surface water, but we're, we're 600 feet deep here under the surface, when you see this is invariably, it means that there's a channel above you. The channels are aquifers. Uh, that's not that they're full of water, but they carry a little bit of water, and that water uh, comes seeping down through the cracks and stuff, and either the back will be dripping, or if it goes through an area where there's some pyrite or pyrite or something associated with a quartz vein, which in this case it is, then the water will oxidize the, uh, the sulfides with sulfuric acid, and that will mobilize ferric hydroxide. So you have ferric hydroxide, uh, dripping down from the back like this, which is <clears throat> pretty spectacular. So here we are, and uh, we're a long way from any known channel, but it may be simply of drilling a vertical drill hole up there uh, with an air drill, like a leg, uh, and we think maybe here 100 feet, 110 feet, and punch into potentially a channel sitting right above our head. In the length of the Ruby Channel, we have about four of these. So we have three, four places where it may be a simple matter of drilling a vertical hole, finding that there's a channel there, and then stepping up and down the channel, maybe 20 feet, back and forth, back and forth, until you find what's called the gut of the channel or the lowest part of the channel, and get a be able to define a cross-section on it, because what you want to do, of course, is rise up into the gut or the very deepest part of the channel. That's more likely where the gold's going to be. So here we are. We have these nice exploration targets. They're going to cost us almost nothing to evaluate. Uh, we can drill a couple of holes a day and uh, right there in the ruby attic. Don't have to go anywhere, but stay at home and drill some holes. Now, we have a second very promising exploration target on the property. And that is this. This is not the Ruby property, but this is just off of Google. But these are river terraces. Any river that cuts down over a period of time into rock is going to deepen over time and leave perched to its sides older river gravels that were laid down when the gravel was, excuse me, when the river was shallower. So the highest gravels you see up there to the, to the left and the right that's where the river level used to be when it first started cutting down. And those two things marked UG, top right and left, were connected as a surface going right across with the river in the middle of it. And that was the floodplain material to each side. As the river cut down over and over again, it just per it left perched to each side the remnants of that floodplain material, those river gravels to each side. If we can find something akin to this in the ruby mine, it would be a big deal. And I started working on this about six weeks ago, and I have in, in my interpretation of the limited exposure we have in the old maps that we indeed we do have remnants of river terraces along the Black Channel. This means, aside from the new channels that I just spoke about that we might find, we may be able to just go within the old workings go up the side of the river channels, up the channels, up the side of the rim of the channels, and in some way discover that we have perched gravels 10 feet above us, 20 feet above us to each side of us, just a stone's throw, literally, from the existing workings, air supply, and everything else that we could uh, have or, or, or rehab in the existing workings. That could turn the whole future of that mine around no long drifts out there exploring, just a matter of rehabbing some of the old workings and moving to the right and left up to the side of the channels, looking for terrace deposits. Now, that is part of the microgravity survey we're having going on right now is to determine if we can see terrace deposits uh, on the shallower ends of some of these channels that we do have good control on. And if we do, then we'll bring in more sophisticated methods to look deeper. Now, what does river terraces look like? This is a Google image looking down on the Yuba River. Um, and on the lower part of the river, you can see two sets of terraces. They are basically uh, defined by tree lines. You have an upper terrace, which is closer to us, and then 
between us and that in the river, you have a second terrace, which is lower, and then you have the lower, then you have the river level itself. And this just showed that the river used to be much higher than it was. I would estimate here maybe 30 feet higher, and that would cut the upper terrace. That was where the river used to be. The river dropped down, cut the lower terrace, and that is cut down again, down to its present river level. And this is, if you visualize the Black Channel as being the running river down there, it would no problem at all that you may have stacked terraces like this sitting above it. That the river down there is not very big. It's it's actually maybe 60 feet across, 50 feet across, about the same size as the old Black Channel. And so you could have substantial terraces that look like this sitting along the rims of it on one side or the other. They're not going to be continuous. They get they get eroded out, but you could have pieces of it like this. And uh, with a lot of gravel on them. Now, this is a picture from New South Wales, and what I'm trying to show here is on the bend of a river. The bends of the rivers where you're very likely to get terraces remnant. Uh, the river is going downstream from top left to lower right, and you have two sets of terraces here. You have a very old terrace, which are the outer matched arrows pointing to each other. On the left, you have a perch terrace on the inside bend of the river and is matched on the outside bend by a cut over there. That's the that's the old the same elevation. That's the oldest terrace. And then the inner matched arrows point to the remnants of a lower terrace. There's not much left of it. There's not very big. But if it had a bunch of gravel on the top of it with a bunch of gold, that would be a dandy, you know, very worthy little mining area or, you know, a mine uh, target. And the river channel here is about the width of the Black Channel. It's about 60 feet wide or so. And so the thing is, is that when you're in the workings of the mine, you're in a little tunnel there, 8 by 10 or something like that. There is no way that you can sense that these terraces may or may not be there above you. The only evidence that you have from the underground is to look very carefully at the rim, at the rim gravel to your right and left above you and to see if anything seems to be washing in or mixing in with the gravels above your head. And we do have evidence in the Black Channel of several places where we have quartz gravel coming into the channel from above, which is an indication that as that channel filled with those later sediments, that the waters were crossing an area of terrace where you had some ancient river gravel, in, this, in these cases, which contained quartz which may have been one the remnants of an Eocene channel, which are invariably richer than the Oligocene channel. Because they, the, Ligos, the Eocenes uh, were longer-lived channels, weren't choked with volcanic de debris, and had millions of years to winnow out everything but just the quartz and the gold. So the really interesting thing is, if you, if you visualize that as the black channel, you could have acres of thousands of feet or acres of perch terraces above you on multiple levels that they're completely invisible to you, the underground. The geologic clues are very limited. Uh, the only way you're really going to see them is by geophysics, and we're addressing that problem now. Now, just to show that the mother load had substantial terrace gold, this is up at Downeyville, and along the Uber River there, there are acres and acres of perched gravels that were found in the 1850s and mined out. This is an area here of many acres, tens of acres, that is on a terrace above the existing Yuba River. It is at an elevation about 80 vertical feet above it and about 500 feet back of it. Obviously, if you were in a little mine workings down on the bottom of the existing Yuba River and it was all buried, you would have no clue that these gravels were here. There would be absolutely no clue that they're here. But there was many thousands of ounces taken out of here. And what you see is that the gravels have been stacked up and that the trees and that sort of channel running through there, that's where the sluice boxes were. Uh, the gravels were stacked each side of the sluice boxes and then the ground was cleared. They threw the, the soil and the um, basal layer into there and then stacked the gravels on top cleared off another spark, 
spot down to the bottom uh, ground level and buried the area that they just cleared with gravel. And so this whole area has been turned over twice. And uh, that path you see there with the big trees in it is where the sluice boxes were uh, 150 years ago. Now, when you start studying terraces, which I never have, you start to learn some new, interesting, new and interesting things. Here's a little stream. I don't know where the heck it is, but you see here's some terraced materials that were laid down uh, when this river was five or six feet deeper. And they were laid down uh, to each side of it, so that's the, what you might call the floodplain. And what has happened is that this river, somewhere behind us, downstream, suddenly dropped. It, it used to be at the level at the top of those sediments right there, and down below, it suddenly dropped it, hit a soft spot, went over a waterfall or something. And what happens is that at that point, then the river starts to eat backwards over that drop point. That, that drop point is called a nick point, where the river suddenly drops in grade. It may be only a few feet, and it may be vertical, and you would call it a waterfall, or it may be a few feet, 10 feet, and drops over a length of the river, maybe a few hundred yards, and that's called a nick zone. But what happens at that point is the natural erosion will now take that nick point and move it, start eroding that thing and moving it back upstream. And that nick point will start walking back upstream. And it's really quite interesting. And so if you can visualize it, what happened here, there was a nick point somewhere at our eye level downstream, the water dropped. And that nick point started moving back and, and went right through, right through these sediments. And so if you were to walk back up through these sediments around the corner, you would find that the water level is coming down at the nick point that has migrated through this picture around the corner. And, uh, and what is really interesting is that if you take the terrace, which you see here, and you follow it back, the elevation will always take you back to a nick point. Basically, the river, there will be a point at the, where the river level is at the elevation of these terraces upstream. And at that point, it will be dropping. And that it, the river will be dropping down lower at that point, 4, 5, 10 feet. And that is the nick point. The nick point will migrate through older sediments like this and deepen the channel. And this can happen over and over again such that you could have terraces like this stacked one on top of the other, moving back from the river because of a series of nick points that have migrated through the whole stack over time. This is what a nick point looks like. The river, if you look at to the left and right, you can see it's kind of flat uh, up there in the trees on the rocks to the left. And if you look backwards, you can see that the river level above that nick point where it drops there is at the elevation of that of that rock to the right and the left, just slightly lower. That's, this is what the case is, is that you can take these terraces or where the river used to be and follow it back and you will always come back to where the river level is or was. And in between, you're going to run into a nick point where the rock or where the river has dropped. Now that nick point, which you see there, that little waterfall, that is where the erosions take place. And over time, that that drop there will migrate back up river around the corner and away it will go. But once upon a time, the river was at the level of our eye level and what you see in the background. So I reversed engineered this. Uh, I don't have any terraces that I can identify in the Black Channel. But what I wanted to see is in the workings in the old mine maps, could I identify any nick points? And that would be in the mine workings, because they went along the basement, right along the bottom. It, is there any places where the bottom of the, the basement all of a sudden rose up? The gradient increased, or was there a water pool? I sort of reverse engineered this. I went looking for those, and then, then used the graphics, uh, the level slicing capability, and leapfrog to see if I could sort of separate some of these higher workings and get an indication that they might have been terraces. So, here's another example. Here's in the mother load. 
the 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 benches to the right and left were covered with gravels. They've been washed off, hydraulic off, way back in the 1850s, 49. And and the river level has been lowered because a nick point was established downstream behind us and migrated through this thing, lowering the river level. But if you go up around the corner, maybe 50 yards, you're going to find that that's where the nick point is. That's where the river drops. And that elevation is going to be the same elevation as the benches that you see to the right and left of us. Okay, now here is a diagram of the Big Bend, and i got to talk about this. What I look for in the old workings, which are the tunnels and sea, you can see the old mine map, I was looking for areas where, there were points where the level rose. And in the map, I found two, three locations, what they call ramps. Um, it's hard to see, you don't see the word ramp on here, but there was three of them, and these are the upper two. Um, where the triangle's in, what I call a nick point, is where they indicated there was a ramp, where the basement suddenly rose, uh, and, you know, maybe an elevation of 8 to 10 feet. And then what I did is I took the, I level sliced, starting at that point, and gave it a gradient of 1%, or one degree, sorry, one degree, one and a half degrees, and cut through the elevation, and just cut through, because this map was laid down on my elevation data uh, that I showed you earlier, and cut through. And what it did is it circumscribed a trace, two traces, and that is the red line. So if you look at the lower neck point to your right, you'll see a red line traced out around on both sides of the river channel above the old workings above the old mine map. That's a one per one degree, one and a half degree gradient that goes down, and and circumscribes some of the old workings. And if you go to the top left, there's another ramp there, and I assume that was a nick point. And I did the same thing, and it leaves a trace between what would be the lower terrace, which would be the stuff within it and the uh, and stuff above it. So the upper terrace is the area between the two nick points, and I call the lower terrace, that is, and then the upper terrace would be anything above the upper nick point. And you may have to study this a little bit. But anyway, what it did is it very nicely separated, if you look at the, at the lower nick point, it separated the gravels in the big bend down in the bottom there, where all the most of the gold came from, from areas that were mined higher up, which I've indicated in Hatchard orange color, to above the Big Bend on two sides. And both of these areas were extremely rich in gold. The one to the left above the Big Bend was called the Coconut Grove, which would give you an indication of what the, what the, the nuggets look like. And the one to the right was also an area where gold was very rich. When I was when I was in there first, I, I could get into the area of the right. I did notice it was up higher. That's and then when I did my survey work, it was definitely higher. It was about ten feet higher. And so I didn't really know what to know, to understand that. I didn't know if that was stuff that had washed in from the sides or what. But the mine workings indicate that the workings in these two areas were horizontal. So the laterals, crosscuts, and uh, the workings were horizontal. So what this indicates is I'm fairly satisfied that the nick point, the lower nick point, was indeed a nick point. It's on a ramp in the old workings. And it separates the more recent gravels that were mined in the Big Bend. And later on in the day, when they started going up the flanks of the channel, they encountered these perched gravels. Uh, around the Big Bend, up the top of it, and over to the right in the Coconut Grove in the southern area. And those are indeed terrace gravels. And then we only have one area where we may have even a second gravel layer, uh, perch gravels, terraces, and that's the green. And that's up, up the top center there. And that is consistent with a nick point and a terrace uh, starting there. Those green gravels are about 60 to 80 vertical feet above the bottom of the black channel 
which is the old workings, which has a blue center line going down it. The lower gravels in red are about 10 to 15 feet above the bottom of the channel. So here we have, I think, proof. I'm pretty satisfied with it. Still working on that. Indeed, the black channel does have terraces to each side, at least two terrace sets of terraces. And you can just look at the workings that we have the majority of it, 80% of the black channel, at least on the view here, has not been explored. The, the, the rims have not been explored to see if there's terraces there. So it's very likely that these two sets of terraces, the, the lower one in red and the, and the higher one in green, exist to some extent on both sides of the channel in the unexplored areas. They will not be continuous. They will only be patches here and there, but they could be extraordinarily rich, as these were, and there could be hundreds or thousands of feet of them on both elevations. So a wonderful uh, target right there next to our existing workings. Um, we can come right up under them, use the air supply, the manways, and, and etc. of the old workings and just go upwards a little bit and maybe mine these perch terraces. We don't have to go very far. Uh, now, again, to find them, though, you cannot sense them when you're in the channels, except I come up with some new magical geology uh, tool, which I invariably will, because I always do. Uh, but our primary tool will be geophysics. Uh, we're trying microgravity now. We may either go to some sort of uh, 3D inverted uh, uh, audio native telerix AMT or something like that in the future. Um, so we've got that to look forward to. Now, the next scene is I'm looking, I've rendered this in three dimension. This is looking upstream of the black channel. I've taken the elevations data, the very first picture I showed you. I've warped uh, an image from Google Earth from Yellowknife, which shows kind of the trend of the rocks, which is true north to south, uh, left to right. And this is the lower terrace gravels that I showed you. Upper left is the coconut grove. Those over to the right I've mentioned. Those were shown several times in the images of the of where the chocolate layer and the uh, upper gravels were in my geologic mapping. I showed you that, that top right corner. We had evidence that there was perch gravels up there. Well, indeed, they sit right up above the trace. Uh, which is defined by the nick point on the center left. And on the lower left, on the bottom here, we I have gravels there that are not known, but they're indicated because that's the point in the channel where we have quartz gravel washing in in the upper gravel layer, um, something that I noticed and that the old miners, the, the miners from almost 100 years ago noticed that as well, 80 years ago noticed that as well. So we have an indication that there could be gravels up there. The whole left-hand side, the, the lower left-hand side of this scene, we have no idea what the elevations are in there. We don't know if it's flat in there. We don't. We have no indication at all. But the main thing is we have established or have established that there are perched. There's at least one layer and perhaps two layers or terrace layers that exist above the black channel it's now a matter of establishing where they are because they they will not be continuous. They'll be partially eroded. How do we get to the, how do we find them? How do we get to them? How do we mine them? And finally, I'm going to give you a real world analogy of what the Black Channel looked like, which is where the big gold came from. The hatchard patterns in the Black Channel you'll see a diagonal hatchard pattern. The, the legend is down below there. Diagonal and then a vertical hatchard pattern. If you look up there at the first arrow, it says A. You'll see a little like a raindrop vertical hatchard pattern. And next to it, here and there, a horizontal. This is from Hillstonk back in, in the 1930s. The vertical hatchard raindrop pattern is where the biggest nuggets were found, the big monsters. And the Diagonal hatchet areas were smaller gold, uh, you know, sandy sand, coarse, coarse sand size grout, uh, gold was found. So there, you see, if you look at that where A is and then down below in those other gravels, which happen to be up on an upper terrace, 
you will see there were definite areas where the big uh, nuggets were found. And up at the top left, the B is is the area of the upper terrace of the terrace uh, of the in the coconut grove, and C is what they call a bedrock channel or tunnel, which they was at the was at the same level as all the workings that you see there in the black channel in the big bend, but it went around the rim. They call it a bedrock. Tunnel. They went right around the rim of the old buried river uh, channel along the rim of it. They didn't find anything there. So I'm going to show you a picture which is a direct and present day analogy of what we're seeing here, almost at the exact same scale. And those ABC things, the A indicating where if there is gold, the bigger gold is going to be found, the B, which is going to be a perch terrace of older age, and C. A, where the old channel was at the elevation of the old channel, uh, which created these larger deposits in the Big Bend. Uh, I'm going to show you the same three things now. This is a view of the uh, Yuba River up near Downeyville. It's upside down. The river is going from left to right in this view. This is the same scale as the Big Bend. It's about 500 feet across, and the arrows are pointing to the same things. And what you see here, if you forget the arrows for a moment, is that you see the rivers coming from left to right, and the, the sediments, which are the sands and the boulders and the gravels, are not deposited all the way around it. They're deposited on the outside edge of, these, of, the, uh, of the turn, and basically it's what's called a point bar. Uh, and this, everybody who's taken hydrology knows all about this. But to the novice, the set it, when you when you move water around a turn, it's going to deposit where the energy, where the flow slows down. The rocks are going to drop out, and they're going to deposit on the back turn of your bend in the river. A is pointing at the area where you would find the coarsest gravel, and often the coarsest gravel on a sandbar is in, is 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 characterized by where you see things growing in it because it, it's that's where you can have a little bit of soil and water and that's where you see those trees growing there bushes and that's where the coarsest gravel is and if you remember from the previous image that's where the largest nuggets were found it's exactly that spot not all the way around that bend on that corner of the big bend that's where the biggest nuggets were found that's the reason is that the gravels are coarsest there that are deposited the river is in what is termed the fallway, which is the deepest part of the channel and is in the river where it's running, where you see now things are usually not deposited, not gold and not gravel. C is where they ran the bedrock, what they call the bedrock tunnel around. The, the mine workings went actually right up the middle of the channel where the water used to be, encountered the gravels of A, mined it all out, the rich stuff was where A is, the stuff to each side of it was where the hatchet pattern was, which was of the lower grade material, but it was still rich. And then they drove a tunnel all the way around the corner to C and out, and then out to the left, up all the way up the channel. And C, they didn't find anything. They just ran a channel there. They ran it right up against the rim of the, of the channel, and you can see in the present day, there's no sediments there. There's no gravels. There's no sand. It's scoured out. And so, uh, not surprisingly, when they ran up on the, on the upside of the channel, all the way around there, they didn't find anything. They just ran right through an area that contained no boulders, no sand, no gold. And B, a little bit difficult to see in this scene, but it's, it's a terrace. B is indicated by, the terrace is indicated by a break in the tree line that wraps almost all the way around this bend, uh, all the way around to the bottom right, thin on the bottom right. But B is maybe 10, 15 feet above river bottom. And that would be completely analogous to what we call the coconut grove, which is this upper terrace, the first terrace layer above the Big Bend. This is what the Big Bend probably looked like. It was probably he heavily vegetated. It's cutting into bedrock. Um, and you just had simple terrace perched above it from the time when the, when the river was older.
And finally, that's it. Thank you very much. Been a pleasure. This is an image of from Leapfrog on uh, another project I'm working on. It's a barite mine that just shows you the <clears throat> capabilities of that program for uh, generating a very accurate geologic model. And that's it.